Uh, let me say this at the beginning this morning. Uh, appreciate Alicia picking that song out. Life is worth living, and if you've ever been in a situation in life, and I mean this in all seriousness, if you've ever been in a situation in life where you felt like that not even God could fix your problems, and the devil was really working on you to end your own life, uh, I believe that that is more common than what most people like to admit. I think it happens to, uh, I, won't, I wouldn't say it happens to everybody, but I think it happens to a lot more people than what they admit. Nobody likes to talk about the time when they almost killed themselves or the time when they almost tried to commit suicide or whatever. Um, and sadly, those that succeed um, usually do not give out too much of a warning sign before it happens. And I just want to say to you this morning, whoever this is for, and, and I'm going to be preaching, I'm just going to go ahead and say it this morning, I'm going to preach on death. And uh, I don't know why I'm preaching on it, but I just want to say this morning that uh, if there's somebody here, there's somebody out there that is uh, has thought about or is thinking about uh, ending it all, let me tell you, that I know a God that can fix more than you give him credit for. And I'm telling you from experience that he can. Okay? From experience. He can do it. And um, he'll do it for you. God is a God of life. Amen? And he wants us to have. Jesus said, I've come that they might have life. That they might have it more abundantly. And so... With that in mind, I am going to preach on death, okay? But I'm going to do it in a way that I'm going to just target it in this direction. If you're born again, and you are assured by the Word of God of your salvation, I think all of us, to some extent, fear death. Death is a fearful thing. Uh, it is the end of our life. It marks the closure of everybody that you love and everybody that loves you. It marks the closure of your part of their life. And that's something that's not easy to take. For those that are left behind, the death of someone they love is very, very difficult to, to get through and to work through. I'm sure that a lot of you have already experienced that, uh, but in case you haven't, I mean, I went for a long, pretty good stretch in my younger years with, without anyone that was close to me dying. But when the people that I loved started dying, it was difficult. And... As, uh, as I saw one after another over the years of my life, um, I remember when I went to visit uh, my uncle's family, when my uncle, who was a um, World War II Japanese fighting Marine on those Japanese islands out there, he was laying in that casket in his Marine uniform. I about lost it then. When I saw him there, it, I realized that pretty much all of a certain part of my life was gone now. He was the last one of my aunt and uncle. My aunt had passed away years before him. My grandparents had passed away before them. Uh, one of our favorite cousins, me and Melissa used to play with all the time, Debbie, she had passed on. She died while I was in Kenya. And I realized that that part of my life was over with, and, and it just, I didn't like it. But that's the way life goes in this world, which is why we serve the God that we serve, so that we won't have to go through this ever again once we are in heaven with Jesus. Can I hear you say amen? Can I hear you say amen? Thank you very much for that. So I just want to say on the outset, I don't want you to think that because I'm preaching this, I think somebody's going to 
is going to die this week. Or, oh, he preached that. Uh, somebody might die. Let me tell you something. Somebody's going to die this week. Somewhere. And it might be somebody that somebody you know knows who died. They might be three persons away from you or whatever. But that don't have anything to do with me preaching it. Me preaching it doesn't make people die. But for some reason, God's laid this on my heart. It's been there all week. When I started studying it out, I tell you, I liked it more and more. Let me start out with this. I mentioned this during Sunday school. I mentioned this at the opening of the service. That in Utah, a man used a state law that was designed to get all of the, the nasty LGBTQ literature out of the elementary and middle school classrooms and out of the libraries. They, used, they passed this law in Utah, Mormon country, conservative, to get rid of all this filth that is in all the libraries all around the country. Well, a man turned on them and used that same law to get, again, not just any Bible out of the public school libraries, specifically the King James Bible. The article says, the decision to remove the King James Version of the Bible from elementary and junior high schools in Davis County is it being appealed, while district officials have also received a request from a parent to remove the Book of Mormon. After receiving the challenge against the Bible six months ago, the Davis School District recently removed it from elementary and junior high schools with district spokesman Chris Williams explaining the delay in the process. He said it wasn't just those Bible verses. It was the entire Bible that the original review committee read, he said. Now the district's decision is being challenged. Um, the man who filed the original complaint said this. I thank the Utah legislature and Utah Parents United for making this bad faith process so much easier and way more efficient. In other words, he's mocking. He filed this grievance against the King James Bible and wrote in here and said, I thank all you conservatives for making my job a whole lot easier. I found it easier to get rid of the Bible out of these schools with your own law that you targeted against the LGBTQ filth pornography that they're putting in public schools now. In other words, he did it out of spite and hate for the Word of God. Now we know that there is a war going on. Turn to 1 John 3 while I say this. We know that there's a battle that's been going on for thousands of years to eradicate God's holy word from off of this planet. Can you say amen to that? So let's say, um, let's say that they succeed now. Uh, has anybody ever read Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451? You read that, you know what I'm talking about. 451 degrees Fahrenheit is the temperature at which paper will combust. It'll catch on fire. And the story was about a future society that burns all books because books are dangerous. Books give people ideas. Books give people... Uh, one book will give one group an idea. Another book will give them an opposing idea. And they can't all get along. And so their, their idea was to eradicate all books. All books as being bad. And the only source of knowledge and information that the people got was filtered down from the big brother government down to the people and it shaped the way they think and the story was about one man who was charged with burning books who actually selling a copy of a book and reading it and it changed his life and he decides to not burn books anymore but join in with people and he found that there was people that even though all the copies of a certain book were gone, there were people in these runaway groups that he joined that had actually memorized whole or partial copies of each one of them. So let's say that they succeed in eradicating this world of all the King James Bibles that there are. Getting rid of every single one of them. 
You know what they'll have to do next, don't you? They'll have to come after those who have hidden God's word in their heart. Because as long as you have people in this world who still believe God's word and have memorized God's word, you will never get rid of God's word. Now, is that really what all the mean, nasty, evil people and all the devils are after? Let's wait and see. Okay? 1 John chapter 3, verse 10. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. That's one of the commandments that we're under. So love your neighbor as yourself. And verse 12, he said, Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one. In other words, Cain's going to represent the side of evil. He's going to represent all the principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. He's going to represent the devil. He's going to represent the Antichrist. He's going to represent everything that's vile and foul and evil in this world. Cain was of that wicked one, and he slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Why did he slay Abel? What was it about Abel that was so abhorrent to Cain that he wanted to kill him. Did, did Cain do anything physically? Or did Abel do anything physically to Cain? Did Cain punch his brother out? Or no, Abel, did Abel, did Abel take a rock and beat Cain, his brother, up? Did Abel steal any of, of, of Cain's sacrifices while he had his back turned? Did he, did he spit on his mama? Did he, did he call him a bad name? No, Abel didn't do anything. The only thing that Abel did was be right with God. That's all he did. And believe it or not, that was enough for Cain to say, I hate him. I cannot stand his presence any longer. And I'm going to kill him. And so... Wherefore slew he him? Because his own works are evil and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. And I, I'm going to say this morning that the ugly head of why the world hates us is coming out, isn't it? And they're using a lot of different reasons but at the forefront is the LGBTQ pedo plus movement. They are using that and saying that because we oppose that along with other ungodly lifestyles, but because we oppose that and because we don't favor that and because we believe that that is a sin in the eyes of God, that we are promoting hate speech, that we are... That we are promoting people to do violence against gays or transgendered or sodomites. You have never heard me ever say at any time we need to kill all the sodomites because they're gay. We need to slay them, get them off. You've never heard me say that. And you never will. But that's the accusation. They say, we don't want you making hate speech because you're going to incite somebody to do something else. So marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. And let me tell you something. First John makes it clear that if you like the world and the world likes you, you're not right with God. That was my problem years ago. Was that I wanted favor with the world. And you can't do that and stand in God's pulpit at the same time. Can't be done. God had to teach me that with a rod of chastisement. So marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know, watch this now, that we have passed 
from death unto what? So, let me ask you this question. What does the death of someone who is born again represent? What does their death mean? Say it, say it out loud. I heard John mumble something. Eternal life. Now everybody say it. Eternal life. So let me ask you this again. What does the death of a saved, born again child of God represent? And is it eternal life that now they have to wait another thousand years to get? It is immediate. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, the Bible says. I believe what Jesus said about Lazarus. When he died, the angels of God came and carried him directly to God and said, Here he is. And Lazarus was with God and still is there. And he's not leaving. Amen? Because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. And you should be afraid if that's your case. Father, I ask you to bless this message. Father, help me, Father. And I'm, I'm weak already and a little sore. And I pray, dear God, you'd help me preach this morning. But bless your word in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, look at Genesis 4 very quickly. This is what it says. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. He just killed him in cold blood. For no other reason other than what we already said, the fact that Cain was not accepted by God, but his brother was. And so I guess you could say maybe it was jealousy, envy, that God, how come is it that God loves my brother and he doesn't love me? Well, the Bible says that all of Cain's deeds were evil. Cain was a wicked, old, nasty, vile sinner. And Abel, at least we know that because he's a man, we know he's a sinner. But he's offering the sacrifices of faith in believing that through those sacrifices, his sins being rolled onto the cross of Calvary, even though he doesn't know that at the time, that God is going to forgive every one of his sins. Where's Abel at right now? He's in heaven. And his blood speaks to this day. But the blood of Christ speaks better things than that of Abel, the Bible says. So I mean the very first family in the world. And the very first two children in the world. You already have the murder of an innocent person at the hands of someone who is guilty of more than just murder. And for no other reason other than God showed his favor to Abel, but he would not show it to Cain. And Cain said, fine, if that's how it's going to be, I'm going to destroy that everything Abel represents and I'm going to kill Abel. And that spirit now has resided in this world ever since that day. Throughout history, the evil people of this world have sought to destroy, eradicate, murder, kill, crucify, slaughter, martyr, uh, martyr every person who calls on the name of the Lord. The fact that you're not dead yet is simply by God's grace. But let me say this to you as I go on. I mentioned the other day, some people don't like to hear about Bible prophecy because it scares them. You know, you start talking about beast and the mark of the beast and, you know, nobody can buy or sell except they have the mark and then people's going, oh my goodness, we're going to starve to death. I don't know what I'm going to do. And then you start hearing of wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and pestilences and you hear about all these evil things that are coming on the world and, oh my goodness, I don't want to go through that. That sounds terrible. That's awful. And Roy mentioned D-Day, what we don't, 
think much about D-Days, not just the guys that rolled off on, on uh, Omaha Beach, 3,000 got killed that day, but the number of innocent French citizens who were bombed and killed and shot simply because they lived in the crossfire between the Allies and the Germans. Innocent people lost their lives. And let, let me just say this to you. Here's what I'm getting at. Everybody that you know is going to die. And everybody that knows you is going to suffer your death one of these days. Does that make sense? So I just want you to think about this. How many people do you know that are going to die? Every one of them. How many people in the world are going to die? Every one of them. Do we not understand that every time we see a casket, that's our future home? That's where we're going to be. And here's what I'm getting at. Everybody is going to die and you are going to die of something one of these days. I would much rather my death be for the glory of my Savior, Jesus Christ, than to die wasting away in a hospital or hospice or nursing home. Now, I don't know that I get that choice. But if you were asking me what I'd rather have, I'd rather die for the cause of Jesus Christ than for any other reason. Because I'm going to die anyway. And there's no getting around that. Hebrews chapter 2, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Now stop and think about this for a minute. When Jesus died on the cross, and he destroyed the power of Satan, who had the power of death, I will ask you the question, when is Christ going to die again? Never. He's already died, and in dying, he defeated the one who has the power of death. So he's not only still alive, he is alive forevermore. He's not going away, amen. And when a saint of God dies, they're not really dead. They are more alive now than they ever were down here. Do you understand that? Listen, we're not talking about funerals. We're talking about graduation ceremonies. Whew. So when you die, you in your death, because of Christ, will destroy the one who had power over death. In that, once you die once, you will never have to die again. Thank God! Verse 15, deliver them who through the fear of death. Look at this. So if you're lost today, and you don't know if you're going to heaven or not, you fear death. And you should. The world wants everybody to think at a funeral that everybody that's laying in the casket is going to heaven. Everybody's going to heaven. Oh, there's Uncle Charlie down there. Yeah, yeah, he was a womanizer. He was a drunk. He was mean. He beat his wife and kids all the time. Every time you saw him, he had a whiskey bottle in one hand and he was beating somebody up with the other hand. But he's in a better place now. Why do people say that? Why is it that at a funeral, it seems like the worst people that we know all of a sudden, suddenly are just good enough to go to heaven? I don't know. Maybe it's fear of death that causes everybody to say that because I guess it makes them think, well, if Uncle Charlie's in heaven, then I guess I'll be a shoe in Truth of it is, Uncle Charlie's in hell, and that's exactly where you're headed. 
And you need to be very afraid of dying. Because when you die, you're, they say, well, he's not suffering anymore. Let me tell you something. When you die and you're lost, your suffering has yet to begin. You don't know suffering until you end up in the lake of fire burning with brimstone forever and forever and forever. You don't know suffering until you reach hell. So he says, Deliver them who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Death grips us. The fear of death grips us. It gets a hold of us. It makes us do and think irrational things. And we shake and we fear. It is what, I mean, God put something in us to want to wanna live. The fear of death is what keeps soldiers on the battlefield from advancing against the enemy. I don't want to die. And here we are, just days away from June 6th, D-Day. And I can show you the film footage of men who were ready to take the bullets so that the guys behind them could get off the boat. Those guys knew that their death would actually mean something. So verse 16, Verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in, the, in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Now let me ask you a question. Was Jesus afraid the day before he died? You better believe he was. He even asked his heavenly father, knowing that God's plan was still God's plan. The, the humanity part of Jesus was saying, God, if there be any other way. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. In that, the spirit that was in him overcame the flesh and the fear in his flesh that didn't want to die, that didn't want to get scourged the next day, that didn't want to get beat up the next day, that didn't want to have men spit on him and curse him and mock him, didn't want to have a crown of thorns on his head, didn't want to suffocate for hours on end on the cross. That part of him did not want to go through that. And you know what? I don't blame him for that one. Having been at death's door myself, I can tell you, I'm not looking forward to the real deal. I'm not. But I sure would like to go to heaven. And that's what it means. Acts chapter 6. We have a man named Stephen. Now, here's, here's where it's going to get into the scary part. If you can honestly say, in your mind, in your heart, you know... I think Brother Mike's right. I think if it came down to it, if God gave me a choice, I think I'd rather die doing something for Jesus Christ and for His kingdom than to just waste away in some program. Because after all, you're going to die. And common sense tells you that some sort of affliction that's bad enough to your physical being to cause your vital organs and your vital bodily processes to fail, it just stands to reason that that's probably going to hurt too. It's not really the death I'm afraid of. It's the fear of the pain that I'll have to go through. At least I'll tell you, the morning I had my surgery, I was so I was so nervous. I said, "You, honey, you drive. I can't." I was a messed up lump of nerves, not because I was going to finally get my. By the way, my gallbladder was like the doctor said it was sick. Glad we took it out. I wasn't jumping for joy. I said, "Oh, my bladder is coming out today. My gallbladder is going to leave today. Praise God, Hallelujah! Can't wait to get there." 
She could see it in me. She said, are you nervous? I said, didn't think I was going to make it. And it wasn't the fear of anything else other than this is going to hurt. This is going to hurt. But I can tell you that whether disease ravages your body or you being killed in some accident of some kind or evil men in this world take your life for serving Jesus Christ. It's all going to hurt. For a little while. And then after that. The joy. That you're going to experience. Will far outweigh. The pain and the fear and the suffering. You went through say amen ladies. Who have given birth. Amen. Ah, he's killing me. Oh, look, he's so beautiful. Isn't that, isn't, that, isn't that the analogy Jesus used in John 16? A woman, when she has travail, has sorrow. But the sorrow's gone for a man child has been born. Amen. So watch this. Stephen was a man, he was full of faith, he got saved, serving the Lord, living the life, living a clean life, full of the Holy Ghost. I'm sure that Peter never said, now Stephen, uh, I've received word from God, now if you get in this thing with us and join us and become saved, I give you about six months, they're going to tear you apart, they're going to kill you. I'm sure Stephen might have said, well I don't know about this. So they didn't tell him nothing. He gets saved, and all of a sudden the issue comes up where they need deacons. So in verse uh, 5, they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, the prophet of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. So here, Stephen and these other guys get elected to be the first deacons of the church. Stephen goes out preaching, and he's doing miracles. Miracles are coming out of him. He's not doing them. God is doing them through him. Just wherever he goes, miracles are happening. People are being healed. People are, de devils are being cast out. I mean, Stephen's got it. And he's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, guess what? Look at verse 9. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and the Cyrenians and the Alexandrians and then of Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. In other words, they didn't like what his doctrine said. They didn't like the fact that he called Jesus King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He, they didn't like the fact that he believed that Jesus was God in the flesh. So, the verse 13 says, They set up false witnesses which said, This man ceases not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. Now, was that true? Did Stephen ever one time speak any blasphemy? If he had, God would have killed him. So they lied through their teeth. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses, Moses delivered us. Now, I want you to notice that they set up false witnesses. Remember that article I showed you. Brother George, they went after the King James Bible in Utah. So we're going to make sure that no child, which... By the way, I was riding a school bus from like first grade to third grade, and then mom started coming here in 74. And nobody had to take that Bible away from Mike. He's too young for that. Nobody ever said that. I sat in church services right next to my mama when I couldn't next to other guys that were not doing right. And I sat next to her and I heard preachers preach the old book and preach against fornication and preach against this and preach against that. And you know what? That, my that introduced me to the fact that I was a sinner, that I needed a Savior and I needed Jesus Christ. 
So what they're really doing is they're not, they're, they're going after the Bible, yes, but they're making sure that none of those kids in those schools ever hears or reads the gospel of Jesus Christ. Notice that they didn't go after the Book of Mormon first. They went after the King James Bible first. So like I said, so let's say they, they eradicate all the King James Bibles out of this world and they got them all burned up and nobody can have access to them. Well, then they're going to have to kill every one of us who's got a portion of the Word hidden in his heart. And you know what I believe? I believe if God needed to, He could pull out of our minds every verse of the Bible that we have ever read so somebody could write it down again and say, this is the Word. He preserves His Word! Amen! Amen! So watch this. Naboth had the exact same thing happen to him. Naboth, in 1 Kings 21, had a vineyard hard by the king's palace, King Ahab. And King, uh, King Biden said, I want your vineyard. No, uh, King Ahab. King Ahab said, I want your vineyard. Either sell it to me, I'll give you the money's worth, or I'll give you a better vineyard than that. And this is what the offer they're making in all these other churches. They're saying, well, a better, a better Bible is this. A better translation is the NIV. A, a better way to say that is the way the ESV says it. No, I like it just the way it is. Amen. There is nothing better or superior to this Bible right here that I got in my hands. Nothing is. That's why Ahab wanted it. What was he going to do with it? Was he going to continue to nurture the vineyard of Naboth? No. He said, I'm going to plow it all down and make a garden of herbs out of it. A vegetable garden. And when Naboth said, the Lord forbid it me that I sell my vineyard to thee. Jezebel said, I'll get it. So she says in verse 7, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread and let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. Now what is the vineyard? Jesus said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and my words abide in him, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be given unto you. My words is what the vineyard represents. And what was Ahab and Jezebel both complicit in? They were going to destroy the word of God that was given to Naboth to possess and to keep, and then to pass it down to his children. I don't, I, I don't want to seem like I'm bragging, but Matthew came, uh, he sent me a text the other day, and he said, Dad, he said, uh, Hunter and Lawson came up to the other day, and they said, Dad, we want to be saved. We want to go to heaven. And so Matthew read the Romans road to him, read the scriptures, prayed with them. So I sat down next to Cheeseburger last Sunday afternoon for, for dinner. Sat down next to him. He looked at me and smiled. He said, Papa, guess what? I'm not going to hell anymore. I got saved. Amen! You know what that is? That's Naboth passing down the vineyard to his son. But Naboth didn't have a son yet. So they were going to make sure that it never got passed down. Are you, are you catching this now? You seeing the handiwork of the devil, how he's working? So, she wrote letters in Ahab's name, sealed them with his seal and sent the letters unto the elders and to the nobles that were in a city dwelling with Naboth. And she wrote in the letters saying, Proclaim a fast and set Naboth on high among the people and set two men, sons of Belial, before him to bear witness against him. That is exactly... What those synagogue men did against Stephen, set up false witnesses against him to lie about him, and that's what they did with Naboth. And by the way, who, what is that, who does that sound like to you? When they captured Jesus, what did they bring against him? Two false witnesses, but their witness agreed not with one another. They were lying through their teeth. And see, that's just the thing. 
This world is going to lie about you. And it's because they don't want to tell the truth about you. Now, oh yeah, you used to be this and everybody knew it. But now you're something different. And they don't want... You know, what, you know what they don't want in California? They don't want some former sodomite coming out and saying, you know, when I got saved and I really got saved, God started working in me and all of a sudden, I just don't want to be a sodomite no more. That'll get you thrown in jail over there in California. That's how wicked they are. They do not want to hear the truth of the transformation of a life full of sin and how God got in it and cleaned up a man or a woman's life. And I'm telling you, it still happens. So they set up two men, sons of Belial, saying, Thou didst blaspheme God and the king, and then carry him out and stone him that he may die. So they stoned Naboth. What did they do to Stephen? They stoned him. Now remember what I said. More than likely... Your death is going to hurt. And, you know, we have Fox's Book of Martyrs to tell us that the Holy Roman Empire took people, tied them to a stake, and burnt them alive in front of everybody. I don't want to die that way. I don't want to be stoned either. In fact, I don't want to be hung, shot, electrocuted. I don't really, I can't really think of a way that I would want to die. Because it seems like to me it's all going to hurt. But if it's for Jesus, I'll do it. I'll do it. He did it for me. Amen. So, in Matthew 24, verse 9, this is the good news that Jesus has to tell us now, Gary. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted. You know what that means? It means they're going to beat you. And they shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. I'm telling you, the setup is right in front of your eyes right now. They are setting this world up to despise those who stand for truth and righteousness. Mark 13, 9. But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils. And in the synagogues you shall be beaten. I told you, that's what it means. It means you're going to be beaten. And my mama would tell you I ran away from every fight that my mouth started. Because you know what I didn't want? I didn't want to get punched in the face or the nose or the eye or the mouth. Or any part, for that matter. Because it would hurt. Listen, I've been running from pain like a chicken all my life. You shall be beaten and you shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake for a testimony against them. You see, Jesus is not just arbitrarily just wanting people to die. So he can say, oh, they did it for me. No, he wants those whom he chooses to stand and be a witness against them for him. And for us to tell this lost world, you should have got saved. I'm here to tell you, you should have given your life to Jesus. Because after you beat and kill me. It's not going to be any better for you. In fact, it's going to be worse. The wrath of God is going to come down on you. And when it does, you're going to remember the words that I said to you today that the Holy Ghost gave me to say. Luke 21, verse 12. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. Yeah, they're going to throw us in prison. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts, not to meditate before what you shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. And you shall be betrayed by both, by, both by parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends. And some of you shall they cause to be put to death. 
And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But there shall not an hair of your head perish, and your patience possess ye your souls. They're going to kill your flesh, but they can't touch your soul. That one belongs to Jesus. Amen? And you know, you just never know. You just never know. Maybe, maybe while they're beating you with stones, or burning you at the stake, Maybe God just does something and He just takes you out before it gets so excruciatingly painful. Maybe God will, maybe God will have mercy on you. If you read, uh, turn, turn back to um, Acts chapter 7. I thought I had that in my notes. Yeah, I do. Look, look up on the screen. Acts 7. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Now, I'm, t I'm here to tell you. I have seen it, and you know my testimony. I've seen it in so many people's lives that hours before they died, they knew because God told them. And I believe that it's possible. In fact, I know one case in particular where this woman dying of colon cancer said she woke up out of a, a, a time that she was just passed out. She woke up and she said, Jesus was just here in this room. I saw him. She wasn't talking out of the side of her head. She wasn't crazy. I believe she saw Jesus standing in the room with her. Is that possible? Well, Stephen looks up and sees Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. Do you think it can happen? You remember James Bonds? He got leukemia and the preacher went and talked to him. He gave his life to the Lord and got saved. And on his deathbed that night, mom said, he said, do you hear that music? And they're going, what music? He said, that's the prettiest music I've ever heard in my life. Y'all want to hear that? Oh, that's so beautiful. And he died. He went to heaven just that quick. You know what, though? His wife and his two boys. His wife died lost. Both boys are lost. Are they both still alive? James died. And I... James was evil. He was pure wicked before he died. And the other son is still to this day lost. Having heard their father's testimony of hearing the angels sing to him. And they didn't want anything to do with the gospel. Whew. So in uh, verse 59, they stoned Stephen calling upon God saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, I like that. Because that's how I want it to happen. I just want to fall asleep and wake up in heaven. That's what happened to Stephen, isn't it? We don't see him going, Oh, stop! Oh, stop! I'm sorry! I didn't mean it! I didn't... He prayed like Jesus prayed. Father, forgive them! Lay not this sin to their charge. I, I, w I want to go that way. That's it. Oh, I wasn't, wasn't quite done. Galatians 2.20 I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth within me. Philippians 1.21 For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Romans 12.1 I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. 1 Corinthians 4.13 Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. Matthew 16.24 Look at your Bible. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his what? His cross and follow me. Luke targets that passage and adds more to it. He said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Do it 
and follow Jesus and take up your cross because that's what they're going to hang you on one of these days. And wear it gladly. Bear the reproach of Jesus Christ with gladness in your heart that if they hate you, it's because they hated Christ first. And in that, I believe God will give you rejoicing. Amen. Revelation 12, 11, And they overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives under the death. You see, I just, if you were to ask me now, Mike, all that stuff you're saying about death, are you sure you're not afraid to die? I am absolutely afraid to die. In my flesh, I am afraid to die, and I fight it off every day. But I, I believe that to those who've committed their life to the Lord and are His saints, that God makes the time of your death the most glorious thing you could ever experience in this world. That's what I believe. When I see the examples of men like Stephen and others, and like here, Revelation 12, that they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, that means that whatever was being done to them, they took it. And how? What gave them the power? The blood of the Lamb. And by the word of their testimony. See, there it is right there. They're after this, which is in our hearts. And they can't abide the fact that this book is still around in people's hearts. They can't handle it. And so they say, we're going to get rid of every copy and then we're going to kill everybody who has it in their heart. Now, I don't think they're going to kill everybody because some people are going to be alive when the Lord appears in the air and they're going to get changed. Amen? But it'll be a turkey shoot. Who's going to die and who's going to live? I don't know. Be prepared for either one. Let it be in your heart that you're going to die anyway. You might as well die for something right because you're living now for something right. Amen? And no sense wanting to change it at the last five minutes of your life. Receive it with gladness. Now again, I have no idea why God laid that message on my heart. It's a good message. I enjoyed studying it out. I got happy. I don't know when I'm going to die or what I'm going to die of. But if God gives me a choice, I want it to be for Him. And if God gives me a second choice, I want every one of y'all, including all y'all online, to die at the same time I do. That way, no, but none of us will weep. Let's stand. All right, so maybe this message is not so much about how the saints are going to die. Maybe it's more about how the lost people are not going to die. Lost people are going to die a wasted life. A ruined life. People are going to lie about you at your funeral. They're going to have to. Because to tell the truth is too painful. And to be honest, you are scared literally out of your mind at the thought that you could die today and that you would die without Christ. And the truth of it is, there is no reason for you to die that way. Not when God made it 
as simple as calling on the name of the Lord. So this morning, you've heard all the glory that awaits those who die. I, I didn't. I forgot this verse. Precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of His saints. God has a God has a big, big memorial get together for every one of His saints that dies. He welcomes them into heaven with joy and gladness and trumpets and angels singing and all kinds of things going on. But that's not going to happen when you die. When you die, the last words you're going to hear from God are, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I knew you not. And then for eternity... You will scream in agony with no comfort and no help. And you had the chance to set things right with God and you didn't take it. Father, I come before you this morning and I thank you, Lord, for the message. I thank you for the words. God, to me, they are encouraging words. I know I'm going to die. I'm, I don't, I'm not going to shy away from that. I know that those that love me, my family, and my friends, my church people, I know that it would cause great sorrow. I know that it would, that it would hurt them. And so, Father, for their sakes, I would stay here. For their sakes, I would. But Father, when it is my time, Lord, I do want to be found doing something for you. And in my own flesh, I cannot guarantee that. But you can. You can, you can make a promise. And you can keep that promise. And so Father, I ask God that when it's my time, that I go in peace, that I go in joy and gladness, having done what you have called upon me to do. And for the world's sake, Father, that I remain here to do the work that you've called me to do. And Father, I think that's probably true of practically all who are listening to me today that are born again. But Father, to them that are lost, they will never experience any of that unless they call upon the name of the Lord. Lord, would you lead them and guide them to do that today so that they never, ever have to know the suffering and the wrath of a just God delivered down upon their soul. Father, we love you and we thank you, Lord, for hearing the words of the Lord. We pray that you'd bless them in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.